why I apologize, y'all did such a wonderful job of getting quiet and I was just up here, up here starting the PowerPoint. But we'll go ahead and get things started now. Well, good morning and welcome to services here at the 6th and Washington Streets Congregation. If you're visiting with us, thank you for joining us today. We are always happy to have visitors. Invite you back every opportunity you have. If you are visiting, know that there are attendance cards you can find in the back of the pew in front of you. And there are opportunities if there's something we can do for you, be it a call or a visit, perhaps a Bible study, uh, you can let us know. Those can be placed in the collection baskets you'll find at the back of the auditorium. Those who will be taking a public part this morning, Tim Wells will be leading our singing. Michael Morgan will have our opening prayer. Bill McFarland will have our scripture reading. Don Dollison will lead our minds at the Lord's table this morning. And Hunter will be speaking on the topic of a broken heart. We'll let Tim get things started.
In uh, Acts uh, chapter 20, verse 7, we read, Now on the first day of the week, when the disciples came to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his message until midnight. Uh, for 2,000 years now, uh, Christians have been meeting on the first day of the week to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf. We have the, the bread, which represents the, his body that was uh, beaten almost to within an inch of his life and, and then nailed to the cross. And we have the fruit of the vine, which represents the, the blood of Jesus that was shed on our behalf uh, for the forgiveness of our sins. And um, so let us uh, thank, thank uh, God for the, for the bread. Our Father, who art in heaven, we thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your only son down to die on the cross for our sins, that in spite of falling short of the example that he set while he was there on earth, that you can still love us so much that you'll um, see past what we do and, and forgive us, and give us an opportunity to, to spend eternity with you in heaven. And we thank you for this reminder of of all he went through for us and all the grace that you've given us. Um, in Jesus' name, amen.
Let's give uh, thanks for the fruit of the vine. Our Father who art in heaven, we thank you for your patience and not being in any hurry to, to judge us, to give us uh, times to repent from our sins. We thank you that the fruit of the vine represents the, the blood of Jesus that continually washes over us and cleanses us uh, even though we fall short of his example. And we ask that you watch over us and guide us and help us to make good decisions so that you'll be proud of us and you'll uh, want, to, want us to be in your kingdom when the time comes. In Jesus' name, amen.
Did uh, we miss anybody with uh, either of the emblems? Well, we have uh, baskets at the rear of the auditorium as you come in or out that uh, you're welcome to make a contribution if you uh, feel so inclined. Uh, it's your based on your generosity, what we can do here as far as helping others and reaching out to uh, spread the word around the world. And uh, uh, let's give thanks for our uh, prosperity. Our Father, who art in heaven, we thank you for the many blessings we have in this life. And we ask that you guide us and help us to make the most of those blessings. And and help to use them to bring others to come to know you better and to make uh, everybody's life a little easier. And uh, please guide us to, to put you first and to, to be examples to others so that uh, others can, can see you through us and come to know you as we know you. In Jesus' name, amen.
on following the lesson will be number 605, 605. Could you bow with me, please? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to this day so thankful for another day of life that you've blessed us with and an opportunity to gather here together with those of like faith. But we ask that as we continue through this service today that you help us keep our minds focused and to not take this time that we have together for granted. Lord, we ask that you help us to ward off the thoughts and the worries of the world and help us to have our minds set on you and this place of worship. We ask that we don't simply go through the motions and try to check boxes and think that we've done so much for you, but recognize all the things that you've done for us. We ask that we listen intently to the words that are spoken and wholeheartedly sing the words when we have the opportunity to sing, that we can learn through all the things that we hear and what we say, and it's through these things that we grow closer to you. We ask God that you help us to retain this thoughtfulness, this meditation throughout this entire week, even when we aren't together, and that we have the hope that we have others that are with us in this fight, in this race, and we know that with you, all things are possible. We ask God that you cleanse us from our sins and help direct our steps so that we become better servants of yours each and every day. And it's in Jesus' precious name that we pray, amen. The scripture reading for this morning is the 51st Psalm, Psalm 51, and I'll be reading from the English Standard Version. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I, will treach, then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would not give it, excuse me, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. Do good to Zion in your pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices, in burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings, then bowls will be offered on your altar. I want to thank all the men who served this morning for the excellent ways in which we have been led in our worship, not only at the Lord's table and at the songs, but for the excellent prayer and for the excellent scripture reading. There was a joke that was made in the back before service starts, and uh, it gave me a chuckle. It might give you a chuckle, but 
the land said, you know, we should have switched that Psalm 51 to Psalm 119 <laughs> and see how that worked. Of course, Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the entire Bible, has over 100 verses. And so that probably wouldn't have worked out too good. I probably would have gotten up here for about five seconds for my sermon, which maybe that's what you folks would like. I don't know. Speaking of that, this will be the last time I'm in the pulpit till the month of June. Roger is going to be taking over the pulpit duties in the month of May, and I won't have any other time to say this um, until I get up in the pulpit again in June, uh, but I would just like to express my gratitude for being able to share the pulpit with Roger over these months, and I know that in the month of May as he's closing out his sermons and his messages that he gives you, uh, that he will faithfully proclaim the gospel and the truth to you. Uh, in the month of May, as he's done here for 38 plus years now. And so I want to say my thanks and appreciation and gratification for being allowed and uh, being blessed to be able to share the pulpit with Roger through this time. Also, I'd like to say that for the month of May, since I will not be in the pulpit, uh, I will be freed up to do some song leading if the opportunity arises. Um, I love leading singing. I, I love singing and, and just music in general. If there's any man who has a night or a morning scheduled in which they would not like to do that or perhaps something comes up or maybe you'd just like to be gracious enough to me to give me your spot and uh, try to lead singing once, uh, I would appreciate it. I think this would be the best time because after May I'll be in the pulpit every week and so it'll be kind of hard for me to lead singing and I could do it technically but it'd be kind of weird to lead singing and then preach and then lead singing again and I've had to do it before but it probably wouldn't be the best thing so if there's anyone here who's going to be leading singing in the month of May and perhaps you'd like to give me a shot at it I would appreciate that this morning we're going to be discussing a broken heart there are all sorts of, of reasons for a broken heart as the world calls it today death of a loved one the infidelity of a spouse, or perhaps calamities. Maybe the losing of a, a home due to a storm or something of that nature. These things can cause us to have a broken heart. It's actually possible to die of a broken heart. It is actually possible to die of a broken heart. And it's not just metaphorical, though that's how we use the word, but a broken heart syndrome is also called Takasubu cardiomyopathy, named after the Japanese physician who identified it. It occurs in response to sudden emotional stress, particularly grief, and that comes from the Cleveland Clinic. It has been documented in at least 11 cases and maybe more. I, hadn't, I didn't do a tremendous amount of study on this myocardiopathy or whatever it is, that there's at least 11 cases or perhaps more where people have actually died from a broken heart. Uh, they are under so much intense grief and stress that their heart simulates a heart attack or it seizes and simulates cardiac arrest. A broken heart is very, very serious, and I'm not some guru. I can't give you all the ins and outs of how to mend a broken heart. If, if something happened in the world or something happened in your life that was tremendously hurtful, I, I can point you to the scriptures, but I can't give you any sort of worldly wisdom in that respect. However, the broken heart that I want us to consider this morning is, is not one where, you know, if your girlfriend leaves you or something like that, or one that's been written in thousands of country songs. The broken heart that I want us to consider this morning is a broken heart because of sin. A broken heart because of sin, because of the sin in your life. The Bible gives us advice and instruction in our times of need and it is in the story of David we see the great and appropriate response in heartbreak and that is godly heartbreak there is a way to have godly sorrow and there is a way to have godly heartbreak and that's what we see 
in our text. We saw it in the reading of Psalm 51 that Bill read for us a moment ago. But in order to understand Psalm 51 a little bit better, I think we need to look back at the context and we need to see for ourselves this morning a timeline of events. When you look back, and I'm not going to read the verses. I'll have them on the screen in a minute for you. I'm not going to read all of these verses for you this morning. It would just take too long. But I would encourage, I would encourage you to mark those verses in your Bible or to write down a note and read these at some point today. This will add to you a great contextual depth when it comes to Psalm 51, why David is writing this psalm, and the importance of it. But for now, let's discuss it briefly before we continue on with our lesson. First of all, David sees Bathsheba, and all of these verses here will be from 2 Samuel. David sees Bathsheba, and he sees her bathing on a roof, and he lusts after her, and he indeed wants her. And that's what he gets. He gets her. And so he calls her to his chambers. He commits fornication with Bathsheba. She becomes pregnant, we later find out. This was a sin in the eyes of God and a sin in the eyes of David. He knew what he was doing. And a sin in the eyes of Uriah. And most likely it would have been a sin in the eyes of Bathsheba as well. They were guilty. They knew what they did was wrong. They knew what they were going to do was wrong, but they did it anyway. David could have had any woman that he wanted. He had multiple wives. He was a king. He probably had several women around him at all times. Uh, but yet he took this man's wife. And so in 2 Samuel 11, 1 through 5, we see that David sees Bathsheba bathing. He lusts after her. He wants her. And he commits adultery with her. We then see that in verse 15, David and Uriah are speaking. Uriah is a good man. And David essentially orders the execution of Uriah, Bathsheba's husband, by placing him on the front lines of the battlefield and then commanding that the army of soldiers withdraw from his presence. And so Uriah would have been the first one to die. First one to die, it would have been a guaranteed death for Uriah. Why did David do this? Why did David command this? Uriah was a friend of David. He could have went home to his, to his home. He could have went to be with his wife. Instead, he chose to sleep at the door. And we see that in the context of 2 Samuel 11. He cared for David. He respected David. And David ensured that Uriah died. The real reason for this is because Bathsheba became pregnant. And David didn't want it getting out. And David didn't want to deal with the consequences of his actions. And so instead of speaking to Uriah like a man, David cowered behind his soldiers and he devised a plan to kill Uriah the Hittite. We then see David and Nathan. This is found in chapter 12 of 2 Samuel. And Nathan is a prophet of God that's sent to David. And he simply tells David a parable in which we will read in a moment. But this parable gives David the realization that I messed up. I did wrong. David says, you are the man that this parable is about. And as a result, you will be punished. David's child ends up dying because of David's sin. Because of what David and Bathsheba did. And it's all these events and it's all these accounts that bring us up to Psalm 51. It is all these things that bring us to Psalm 51, and we see that here David pens this psalm out of complete anxiety, depression, a complete heartbroken spirit is what David has. Firstly, in our text of Psalm 51, David has a realization of wrong. There's a realization here, and I'm going to read these verses. Bill read them so, so well earlier, but I want to repeat them. I want to read them again. Psalm 51, 1 through 5, and verse 14. Be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the abundance of your compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only, I have sinned. And done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak, and pure when you judge. 
In verse 14, David says, Deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God, the God of my salvation. Another way to translate that is, Deliver me from the guilt of shedding innocent blood. David had blood guiltiness upon his soul. He realized that he murdered an innocent man. This man had never done anything wrong to him. If it wasn't enough that David committed adultery with his wife, he then has him killed on the battlefield. This is racking David with pain and heartbreak, and he can't take it, and he's just asking, and he's just wishing that God would deliver him from this guilt, that he would deliver him from these sins. David had a realization that what I have done, what I have done is wrong. And even if God didn't forgive me for it, it's still wrong. Even if I wouldn't be punished for it, it's still wrong. This is the difference in believing, or I'm sorry, being sorry for doing wrong and being sorry for being caught. I like to think of children when it comes to this regard, but I suppose we're like this too, in a sense. You ever heard the, maybe the phrase, I, 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 I'm so sorry I, I, I did wrong. I'm so sorry I did that to my sister. Uh, I, I'll never do it again just as long as you give me back my toy. You know, I promise that if you give me back my toy, I'll never do it again. I promise. I'm sorry. Now, we know that that is not actually being sorry. It's sorry for getting caught. It's not actually sorry for doing wrong. See, in that instance, the child doesn't really realize what he has done is wrong. He doesn't feel any guilt about it. All he feels is a desire for what he had, he once had, and now he wants back. You see, we see this in adults, too. But we have to realize that this, in our text, is a showing of David truly realizing that he is wrong. He's not sorry for being caught. He's sorry because of what he's done. He realizes the depth of what he has done. In 2 Samuel 12, 1 through 7, I want, I'd just like to read this parable for you. Then Yahweh sent Nathan to David. And he came to him and said, this is 2 Samuel chapter 12, we're starting now in verse 1. There were two men in one city. Now listen to this parable. Two men in one city. The one rich and the other poor. The rich man had a great many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he bought and nourished. And it grew up together with him and his children it would eat his morsel of bread and drink of his cup and lie in his bosom. And it was like a daughter to him. Now a visitor came to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take from his own flock or his own herd to prepare for the traveler who had come to him. Rather, he took the poor man's ewe lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Then David's anger burned greatly against the man, and he said to Nathan, As Yahweh lives, surely the man who has done this deserves to die, and he must make restitution for the lamb fourfold, because he did this thing and had no compassion. Nathan said to David, You are the man. Thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, It is I who anointed you king over Israel. And it is I who delivered you from the hand of Saul. I also gave you your master's house, your master's wives into your care. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have added to you many more things like these. Why have you despised the word of Yahweh by doing evil in his sight? You have struck down your eye the Hittite with the sword, having taken his wife to be your wife, and have killed him with the sword of the sons of Ammon. You see, David was upset. He was, he was angry. He was fuming. He was boiling about this poor man. He didn't have anything. He had this one little lamb. 
This rich man had any lamb he could have wanted. He had all these lambs. Why would he take the poor man's lamb? David couldn't understand it. Nathan said, David, that's you, man. That's you. You have multiple wives. You have all the riches of the land. You could have any woman you want, and you take Uriah's wife. And then you kill him. You took what was not yours when you should have been thankful for what you had already. David comes to this realization here in 2 Samuel. In verse 13, David says, I have sinned against Yahweh. Folks, if he didn't realize it before, he realized it then. David understood and he realized that I've sinned. I've messed up big time. He had a realization of his wrong. David bore the full weight of his broken heart. He realized that he had done wrong. In our text, we not only see a realization of wrong, but we see a repentance of wrong. In verses 10 through 13 of Psalm 51, the Bible says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted to you. You see, David repented. He no longer wanted a battered and bruised and broken heart. He wanted a clean heart. David understood and he realized that he could not clean his own heart, that he could not wash himself of any iniquity, that he could not purify himself with hyssop. He could not do anything to justify his actions or to forgive himself of his actions. If David wanted to be cleansed, he needed God's help. And so he appeals to God, not to himself, but to God and says, create in me a clean heart. Maybe you've done something really bad in life. Maybe you've done something you never told anybody. And you know that God has known what you've done. You might have tried to forgive yourself for it, but you just can't. There might be something in life that's just eating you up, and you cannot forgive yourself. You've tried. You've tried to make up for it. You've tried to do things as a matter of penance, but you just can't do it. You can't get rid of the guilt in your heart for what you might have done. That's how David felt. And David had to come to the realization that if I need cleansing, if I want cleansing, i got to go to God. And so David repented of his sin. He realized he did wrong. He repented of his wrong. David was ready to give up his old ways and begin a new work telling others about God. At the end of, verse, of this section, in verse 13, it says, Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will be converted to you. David said, I know I've done wrong, but I want, I'm repenting of these things. I want you to change me, God, and I want to I start a new life and do better things. I want to do better. Not only in this text we see this repentance of wrong, but we also, also see a redemption from wrong. In 2 Samuel chapter 12, and verse 13, the Bible says, And Nathan said to David, Yahweh has also taken away your sin. You shall not die. This is very subtle in our text. And I understand David was, was the king. I understand that Jesus had his lineage through David. I understand that Jesus, in a sense, was the son of David. And in the Old Testament, sometimes David is referenced when it's actually speaking of Jesus. But here's the question and here's the issue. What was David's actual punishment? What should it have been? What was the punishment for adultery in the Old Testament? It was death. What was the punishment for killing somebody out of cold blood in the Old Testament? It was death. And it really didn't matter if you were a king or not. According to God's righteous law, you were supposed to die. Why didn't David die? 
because of the grace of God. There were no other provisions in the law. David says it himself in Psalm 51, God, you don't care about burnt offerings or else I'd give them to you. I realize that from what I've done that a burnt offering is going to mean anything. God's grace cleansed David of his sin. Brothers and sisters, how? In Romans 9, I thought the Bible says that the blood of bulls and goats cannot take away sin. Isn't that true? That it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. Yes, that actually is true in Romans, or I'm sorry, in Hebrews 10. But in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 15, I want you to listen to what the Hebrew writer says. And for this reason, he is the mediator, speaking of Jesus, of a new covenant, that is our covenant, so that since a death has taken place for the redemption, hear that word, redemption, of the trespasses that were committed under the old covenant, those who have been called may receive the promise of the eternal or of the eternal inheritance. Have you ever asked the question, how was people <clears throat> how were people like Abraham saved? <laughs> how were people like Isaac saved? You know, or Noah or these guys these guys didn't have, you know, Jesus Christ, they didn't have his blood. The Bible teaches that it's only Jesus who could deliver us from sin. And furthermore, in the Old Testament, we read and have revelation in the New Testament that these sacrifices didn't take away sin. They simply atoned for them and they pushed them forward. And so how is it that David could go to heaven? How is it that Abraham and all these other men, Lazarus, how is it that these men could go to heaven? Here's the answer. Because the blood of Jesus Christ runs both ways. Jesus died here and his blood runs forward, but his blood also runs backward. And through the death of Jesus Christ, all people who were faithful to God in their Jewish religion were sanctified and were cleansed of their sin and redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. By the grace of their God. David should have died. That was his rightful punishment. But Nathan said, God has taken away your sin. He didn't look at David and said, don't worry about it, David. God, you know, he's, he's hidden your sin under a carpet. Nobody else is going to see it. You know, we'll keep this a secret between us. But, but you might have to answer for it one day. But, but, but you know, don't worry. Nobody's going to talk about it. Nobody's going to know about it. You know, you're not going to get in any trouble for it, David, but it's still going to be there. No. Nathan said, God took it away. And it's the same with you and I. Friends, don't you realize that when God takes away your, your sin and mine, it's not as if he puts it back on the shelf and says, I just won't look at it anymore. He completely takes it away. It's as if we never even did it. We are completely justified. How can I be completely justified for things that I've done in my life? It's because Jesus' blood took them away. Quite literally took them away. If there was a rock that on the rock inscribed in my sins, God has waxed those things over. They're gone. I didn't commit those sins. Not to God. To me. Yes, it's often harder to forgive ourselves than God to forgive us. David probably had to take a little while to accept his own forgiveness, but God forgave him. God took away his sin. Did he deserve it? No, but God did it through grace. David would go on to write later, and I know it's earlier in Psalm 32, but there is great study to suggest that this is actually a later psalm and it was just put earlier not all these things are in chronological order David would later on go to write how blessed is he whose transgressions is forgiven whose sin is covered how blessed is the man whose iniquity Yahweh will not take into account and in whose spirit there is no deceit David said how blessed essentially he was saying how blessed am I because 
God has not taken my sin into account. And thank the Lord and praise the Lord for that. You see, friends, we see a wonderful redemption here. We see a redemption of the soul of a man who committed grievous sins. But he was redeemed because of the grace of God and because of the blood of Jesus Christ. He ended up having to pay for what he did. As I said, his son died. Terrible. But his soul was redeemed. His soul was cleansed. We see a realization of wrong. We see a repentance of wrong. And we see a redemption from wrong. I'd like to submit to you this morning that this is the exact action that we should take when we realize that we have sinned. When we commit sin, we need to have this same pattern. We need to realize that it's wrong, to actually realize that it's wrong. I don't want to sound presumptuous. If I am, I'm speaking for myself because I've done this. I don't think it's legitimate to say I've realized I've done wrong if you say that one day and the next day you do the exact same thing again. Then you truly didn't realize it. You may have recognized it in part, but to truly realize that you've done wrong is to realize that you deserve punishment for what you've done, whether whether God gives it to you or not, whether you get caught or not, this is wrong and it's weighing you down and you feel guilty for it. To repent of those things, to change your mind about them, and to try to do better. And this is what David did in the text that we see. And to put your faith in the redemption of Jesus Christ. Realize that you can't save yourself. I don't care how hard you try. There's not a single person in here today, including me, that can save ourselves from our own sin. It's just not going to happen. It doesn't matter how good of a person we are, and it doesn't matter how many good works we do. We can't save ourselves from our own sin. We need Jesus to save us from our sin. There is a godly sorrow. There is a godly broken heart. In 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 10, Paul says, For godly sorrow produces a repentance without regret leading to salvation, but the sorrow of the world brings about death. The Bible can cut us up in ways that nothing else can. Sometimes you read the Bible and you realize that makes me feel a lot of guilt, a lot of sorrow. But if it's a godly sorrow, it won't lead to regret. It will lead to salvation because you will repent of those things and turn to God. This is what David did. And it is a godly broken heart that we see. To finish out Psalm 51, I say finish it out. There's a few verses after it, but it finishes that theme. What does David say? You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O oh God. I've met people in life who say, I'm too broken. God doesn't want me. I'm damaged goods. Committed too much sin. I've messed up too many relationships. I'm too broken. I'm not good enough for Christ. And Christ certainly wouldn't want me. And you might think I'm just saying that as a preacher, trying to make it sound poetic. I'm not. I've heard that so many times. I can't even remember how many times. You may be broken. And you may feel like nobody else will accept you. God wants you. And it doesn't matter how broken you feel. and It doesn't matter what you've done. A broken heart and a repentant heart, God will not despise. Your heart's broken. You want to repent of those things. God will accept you. God wants to redeem you. But you have to want to allow him to do it. And remember and realize to let go of any guilt that you feel, the broken heart that you feel about what you may have done wrong in life. And just allow Jesus to cleanse it for you. I'd like to leave you with a Puritan prayer. This prayer is a, a very powerful, I think, testament 
to what we've discussed. No day of my life has passed that has not proved me guilty in thy sight. Prayers have been uttered from a prayerless heart. Praise has been often praiseless sound. My best services are filthy rags. Blessed Jesus, let me find a covert in thy appearing wounds. Though my sins rise to heaven, thy merits soar above them. Though unrighteousness weighs me down to hell, thy righteousness exalts me to thy throne. All things in me call for my rejection. All things in thee plead my acceptance. I appeal from the throne of perfect justice to thy throne of boundless grace. Grant me to hear thy voice assuring me that by thy stripes I am healed, that thou wast bruised for my iniquities, that thou hast been made sin for me, that I might be righteous in thee, that any grievous sins, my manifold sins, are all forgiven, buried in the ocean of thy concealing blood. I am guilty, but pardoned lost but saved, wandering but found, sinning but cleansed. Give me perpetual brokenheartedness. Keep me always clinging to thy cross. Flood me every moment of divine knowledge, sparkling clear and unsullied through my wilderness of life. Though it is a hard prayer to accept, if salvation means to be perpetually brokenhearted, then so be it. That's not what it has to mean. We're supposed to have joy as a Christian. But it is to say that the very brokenness which you may feel this morning is the exact thing that should lead you to God, not away from God. That's what he can fix. I can't fix it, and you can't, and nobody else can, but God can if you have a broken heart because of sin this morning, you are away from Christ. We would enjoy and rejoice if you would put Christ on. Put your faith in him, repent of your sins, and be baptized in the waters of baptism. Dip yourself into the blood of Jesus and his blood will cleanse your soul from sin. Then your broken heart can be mended. What was once broken can be fixed, and you could live a new life in Christ. That's what we hope and we pray for you. If you have that need and you would like to respond to the call, we call you now as together we stand and sing.
closing song will be number 427. Well, thank you, Hunter, for an excellent lesson. Several announcements to share with you this morning. Fortunately, our sick list is much shorter than it has been of late. That's a good sign. In Cleveland Clinic, uh, Sue Beal was there, and here she comes walking back in, so she's obviously home. Glad to see that. Ray Anderson was in the hospital, and he is now at home recovering. Ward Woodyard, that's Brenda Kirkbride's father, is at Ohio Health Rehabilitation in Dublin uh, to continue his rehab therapy. We've gotten to rejoice a number of times of late. Uh, Carly Holdren was baptized last Sunday morning. If you didn't get a chance to congratulate her and welcome her, take that opportunity this morning. She's, she's dry today. So uh, be sure to, to see Carly and welcome her. Carly, would you mind standing up for just a moment? So if you don't know who Carly is, now you can find her, okay? And also, you may not realize, but Jared Eisner was baptized yesterday. And uh, Jared, if you would mind standing up, please. Thank you. Right Church. Uh, be sure to congratulate Jared and welcome him as well. Uh, just for those who will need to participate this evening, so that shouldn't be any of you, but um, the multi-purpose room work is completed, so uh, communion will resume in there this evening. Mm -hmm. Following our final song this morning, uh, Jeremy Patterson will have our closing prayer. Remind you that this evening is our fifth Sunday, so the young men will be leading our services. I encourage everyone to be back and support them as they make those efforts to come up here and do things in a public way so that they can uh, enhance their skills. So let's all try to be out and support them in those endeavors. Now, I don't know that Michael Morgan really needs all that much support from us. I think he's pretty confident about what he does, but uh, be sure to be out for Michael. T.J. Wells will be uh, leading, have our opening prayer. Uh, Owen Morgan will be reading our scripture tonight, and Jake Bradford will be speaking. Now, the topic listed here says TBA. I presume that means to be announced, but who knows? Maybe that really is his topic. But if you'd like to, you can read 1 Corinthians 12, 26, and 27 to get an idea of what he plans to talk about. So we'll let Tim resume our services. We're 427.
Dear God, thank you for giving us another opportunity to come here in this place of worship to hear another lesson from your word delivered so well by Hunter. Um, thank you for the last 38 years of Roger and Diane's commitment and the faithfulness to this community and this congregation and be with him as he transitions into the next phase of his their lives and just thankful for all the many blessings you give us and if it be your will bring us back at the next point of time in Jesus name we pray amen